Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today in our master series, I am again joined by my good friend, Eric Cook, to get back to our series on silent cinema. Eric is an expert on this and on D.W. Griffith, and he has proposed a series of podcasts on this, which I am very happy to join him for. We will continue today with the movie, Birth of a Nation. We have talked already about D.W. Griffith, about cinema, about the transformations that made possible this strangely innovative and nostalgic art form, but we have not yet said very much about the movie itself. We will discuss it now. Birth of a Nation is a three-hour movie. It was an astonishing achievement, of course, at the time, and it is still an astonishing thing to experience now. It is split in two parts. The first deals with the Civil War and the second with Reconstruction. And it follows two families, the Stonemans from the North and the Camerons from the South. It's through these families, Griffith shows his humanistic intentions, tries to show America's character and history, the trials and tribulations, the successes and the failures from the point of view of these few people. And at the same time, he tries to show how they might come together. We see them meet during the war. We see them meet afterwards. And their relationships, the fathers of the family and the, the children of the family, they somehow make it possible to have a reunion of America, even though, of course, the sons from both families die fighting each other's side in the war. Now, I think this shall have to suffice by way of plot, since we will talk some more about some of the scenes later. I think we're all at this point familiar with this notion that goes back to the 19th century novel, at least, that from the point of view of a small cast of characters, you will give not only the gist of an event, but somehow reveal the national character and the national travail. And this, however, is the first time it's done in such a way in cinema, and it would be too little to say that it has influenced storytelling. Praise of Griffith's art, of his combination of technique and narrative, simply cannot give you an adequate view of the achievement. He understands implicitly what the power of the image is, how people's passions will run away with them once you start orchestrating these fantasies on the screen. And accordingly, you see, he is a master of the portrait and of the vignette, and he's also a master of the grand sweeping scene where you see Civil War battles, and he just realizes what a power seeing smoke from cannon has. It's, it's a really astonishing thing. In fact, uh, I like the word part the best. And so I suppose that's why it's on my mind now again. But he goes through so many different kinds of shots, so many different kinds of scenes, from the sorts of things you would see in theater from, to the sorts of things you'd only read about in novels, and so on and so forth, to try to put together a vision of what America went through that would give his narrative, which is, of course, entirely fictional, the power to carry conviction. And however, I have to leave it at this for an outline of the plot. Now, Eric, thanks a lot for joining me to complete our discussion of Birth of a Nation. Now that we have talked about the plot briefly, we should talk about the source novel and the way Griffith has dealt with this story. Yes, thank you, Titus. It's great to come back and hear up our conversation on the Birth of a Nation. And one of the things in your introduction that I thought was very well said is that this does have the feel of a great historic novel. One would think Tolstoy, you know, trying to tell war and peace, the upheaval of the Napoleonic invasion of Russia, but how in a sense it forges the Russian nation. And so Griffith achieves that in cinema, but it is not the case that his source material was as elevated as Tolstoy, and I even put it mildly. The source material comes from Thomas Dixon Jr. And Dixon was a lawyer, a politician, a novelist, a playwright, a lecturer, a filmmaker, a Baptist minister, and ultimately a white supremacist. The novel is The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan, and published in 1905. And it is very much a, a piece of its time. We have in uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, as you alluded to at the end of our discussion last time, the rise of this romanticized view of the South. 
There are good and bad reasons for this. As you said, you know, the South is the least American in the modern sense place in America. It has deep connections to, for interesting reasons, to, to, to European aristocratic traditions. And Dixon wanted to write a novel that would emphasize what he saw was the injustice met the Confederacy and white Southerners in the aftermath of their defeat in the Civil War. The novel was a huge success. It's pretty unreadable. I picked it up as a, a teenager thinking it was the Klansman. I thought it, from the cover, I thought it was about Scots. And then I opened it up to the title page after I bought it at a box lot at an auction at the age of 12 or so. And like, oh, wow. I tried it for a little bit. and I. I couldn't finish it. I've, I've dipped into it once or twice, getting ready for this podcast on Griffith. And Dixon, you know, comes out of this desire for reconciliation. And beginning in the 1890s, there's a, a broad movement among artists and politicians and Americans of all stripes to sort of lay to rest the hatchet of the Civil War. And the way that that's done is by basically ignoring the legitimate needs and concerns and democratic prerogatives of African Americans. So American Blacks are basically thrown under the bus so that American whites can move past the trauma of the Civil War in the 1890s. And so there's a flourishing both of historical writing at that time that just seeks to justify this, and also novels, arts, all kinds of things. Some of them are pretty innocuous, comparatively speaking, that they don't take a racist angle to this at all. Others do, and Dixon is one of the works that does. Dixon was mostly active for a large part of his career in New York City. And part of it, I think, is there's a northern sense of loss as urbanization and industrialization sort of reach mass proportions in the north for an earlier America. And a lot of that desire, this sentimental nostalgia for the lost innocence, gets transferred to the south. And there's sort of a call to the south all throughout 1890 to about the early 1950s. And we see this. You mentioned Gone with the Wind last time. To me, Gone with the Wind, the film, not so much the book, is a perfect example of this. There's significant differences between the novel and, and the film and its tone and its sort of its purpose. But there's a sense in which whites, North and South, are trying to find some way to reorient themselves. And of course, we get the whole mythology of Moonlight and Magnolia. We get the lost cause historiography that comes to life at this time where the South, it was an inevitable defeat. It was a romantic and tragic defeat of this beautiful superior culture that's destroyed by the crass materialism of the North. And there's a very much romantic side to this. And it also, as you said, gets tied up in the, the nexus between early 20th century progressivism and early 20th century racism. Griffith and Dixon were both progressives. They were not conservatives in the political world of the early 20th century, but they also were racists. And the result of that is, I think, makes it quite complicated for, for Americans who are looking for clear-cut dichotomies and just not the way that it's going to be. Dixon's book was published. It was very popular. He then turned it into a stage play and paring down the plot and characters. The stage play was not as successful. It, it certainly survived for a while. It made him some money. It had some success in some secondary and third-tier markets. But even in the South, I found a review online from Richmond, and I've seen and some of the secondary sources, some reviews from North Carolina and other places. Audiences and critics were not that taken with the play. They found it very crude. They found it stereotypical. I mean, even by their standards, they found it problematic. And by 1911, however, Dixon had been trying to parlay the play into a film. And it had been picked up by one of the first film companies that was able to produce color film, but they were in bankruptcy by 1911. And it was from there that it came to the attention of Griffith. And D.W. Griffith, as we talked about, really was in the market for a great narrative that would allow him to tell the story of the Civil War, that would allow him to sort of exercise some of the demons of his father's post-Civil War failures, but also would recapture the honor and heroism of the conflict, as you mentioned before. And so he was really looking for a vehicle to do that. And as I mentioned last time, when he got a hold of the material and went to make his film, he decided he had to push it backwards in time. And he wanted to turn it into more of a family drama. Griffith always likes to center his films around family and the tragedies and difficulties and the beautiful things that happen to families. I mean, Griffith's always sort of filtering this through a 19th century melodramatic lens. But that's really kind of how he likes to anchor his storytelling. Families are the place of tragedy and suffering. They're also a place of quiet nobility. 
And so that makes a perfect overlap for the novel, which he takes some of the elements that were cut from the stage play and reinserts them into the film. He also expands on those themes beyond what's in the original novel so that he can fit in the Civil War. And like you said, I, I really think that some of the best parts of the film are in the first half. Obviously, you know, we, we can admire people doing heroic things, even if we don't admire the reasons that they're doing them. I'm like you, I'm, I'm the descendant of Union soldiers, and I'm a firm Unionist in my sentiments. But he humanizes the Camerons from the South in a way that's very beautiful in the film, and especially in the first half, with this sort of, you know, almost Romeo and Juliet sort of relationship that occurs when the little colonel, uh, the eldest uh, Cameron, ends up in the Union Hospital in Washington, D.C. during the war. When the film, of course, is produced at the uh, New York City premiere, Dixon will go on stage after the performance. There's a, the audience demands that he and Griffith make an appearance. And he says words to the effect that only a, a Southerner could tell this story and tell it the correct way and the way that it should be told. And there's a whole school of historiography at this time in which people are trying to reframe Reconstruction in the Civil War as a tragedy and Reconstruction as the punishment of the South. We certainly see that with the Stoneman family. Of course, the name Stoneman, those of you who are in the Civil War will know that from Stoneman's raid through the Carolinas, this punitive expedition to break one of the last breadbaskets and the functional areas of the Confederacy. And so Thaddeus Stevens is really the character who's the villain. But he's, he's been renamed. He's one of the only historical character who's fully integrated into the plot. And as such, both Dixon and Griffith are going to rename him. So many of the basic details of him are clearly lifted from Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. And of course, fans of rock music know Stoneman's Cavalry from the band, so <laughs> <laughs> famous song. There you have me as a disadvantage. So <laughs> that, that I didn't know that. that's great. As we get into the, the film itself, I hadn't watched the film for many years getting ready to do this podcast. By the way, if you're going to watch the film, this is, you're not, this is not a big commercial endorsement. If you're going to watch it, because live screenings are rare for obvious reasons, both its length and its controversial nature, the two editions to get on DVD or to stream are the Kino Lorber three-disc set with music by the Montalto Silent Film Orchestra under Rodney Sauer, or I think that's a great set Got all kinds of wonderful extras. I think the uh, Cohen Media 2016 release is superior. It has a better, a more fully restored film, and it has the original uh, orchestration with a little bit of tweaking, but the tweaking makes it better than the original. So if you want to experience it with the emotional impact that all you can get, get the Cohen Media version. If not, I, I recommend the Kino Lorber edition. When I watched this recently to get ready for our, our conversation, I was taken aback because I, again, I hadn't seen it in many years, and it was my first time seeing the new Cohen restoration, which was, it was about five years old. I was taken aback by how beautiful it is and how successfully integrated the music and the images are. But the other thing that took me by quite as astonishing was the fact that Griffith opens the film. Not only does he push us back into antebellum America on the eve of the Civil War, he pushes the film back to 1619. And, you know, if you've Follow the controversy of the 1619 articles of the New York Times, the modern age. There we are. I mean, there's that progressive connection. And one of the things that the Griffith does is he opens his film with the importation of African American slaves to Virginia in 1619. He also opens it by showing them being blessed by a clergyman. Now, what's interesting is, of course, 1619, Virginia is an Anglican colony. But it's very clear that the costuming, the clergyman, is meant to evoke the Puritans of New England. And we move immediately from this hypocritical blessing of slavery in 1619 by a clergyman to an abolitionist meeting in the North at the period right before the Civil War. And in that scene, we see a preacher extolling the horrors of slavery and the need to end it. And we see a wealthy white woman and a small black boy who's taken through the audience, who's obviously there to generate sympathy and to help raise money for their abolitionist cause. And a scene that we know exists because it's remarked on by period reviewers and was also asked to be cut by African-Americans who were appalled at it. And you can tell this from what remains in the footage. The white woman is offended by the smell of the African-American boy. And so Griffith, the progressive, frames American history in a nexus between the importation of slavery in 1960 and the hypocrisy of both the clergy and the abolitionist movement. 
and frames them in their relationship to African Americans is hypocritical. The Northern, what's interesting to me is I see the scene with the Northern white woman as an indictment, not of generic racism, although it, it feeds into a, a stereotype, an ugly stereotype, but rather that it's Griffith's attack on Northerners and their revulsion at African Americans who they don't want to deal with. And he's, that's how he frames abolitionism. It's very important for the film that we've moved from then to the immediate late antebellum period. What's elided over completely, of course, is 1776 and all that is implied in that. Yeah, I think the movie is marvelously apposite because you could say that the progressive view of history today that everything was one screaming hellhole after another until today's progressive to control is remarkably similar to W. Griffith's history where the only people who are really wicked are the ones who really oppose slavery. Now, granted, historically, abolitionists are not often prudent people, and they're not necessarily good people either. In fact, it only takes a moment's thinking to realize that abolitionism and racism are perfectly compatible as views. But this notion that the only real problem in America were the abolitionists, and they're somehow hypocritically connected to the Puritan founders of the New England rather than Virginia, you know, that's something that you nowadays hear from progressives. And then, in fact, you could say that this is the progressive view of birth of a nation. It's the birth of cinema, it's American uh, racism, it's white supremacy, it's yeah, da, 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 all, all that sort of stuff. And perhaps you could, we can see why the 1619 Project and all this sort of hysteria today has a certain power. Like Griffith, it has quite a certain talent for what we call setting the narrative. But to, to speak perhaps less abstractly, you have a very clear view of where the origin of evil lies and how the rest of us are victims of it. I think that you're right. Griffith is clearly setting up this framework for his narrative where the people like the Camerons and people, not Stoneman himself, because he's the chief culprit in the plot beyond this sort of generic abolitionist forces. And as you said, you know, we have to be careful. I mean, the abolitionists themselves were sometimes quite racist in their own way. But yes, these other American families are going to be caught up in this vortex, and, and Griffith lays the blame here, even more so than Dixon does in the original source material. And so the whole story then turns to this question of the war that separates families that might have become united in holy matrimony, right? The Stonemans and the Camerons, the sons and daughters, are sweet on each other, and this will be of great importance to the terrible outcome in the second part. Yes, um, you know, it's interesting because the Stoneman boys and the Cameron boys meet each other through school, and so, which, and this is very real, uh, this is part of the reality of antebellum America, that a lot of privileged sons of the South would go north for part or all of their finishing of their education, and they did have these deep friendships with northern families from this educational and social elite. And the other thing that's quite striking on rewatching the film is that we modern Americans tend to think about antebellum America, and I blame bad history teaching for this, there's a great deal of emphasis put upon the sectional differences, which were certainly there. But as the film illustrates, and as you study the period, while there are definitely these sectional differences, they're, they're not just north and south, they're east and west in every which direction, but there's also a sense in which there is a shared American culture, and that's there's an easy back and forth between these families. And building on Griffith's point of view, cinematically, the, the, the point of contention is slavery. But when we see Griffith's depiction of Southern slavery in the first half, when we go to Piedmont, South Carolina, and the, this elegant home of the Camerons, two things that are kind of interesting. One, the mansion itself isn't set out on a plantation. It's set in the context of a small town, which is interesting. And especially because of Griffith's both nostalgia for and criticism of small towns in his other films. But also, there's a separation then between this townhouse. We're not looking at Tara like in Gone with the Wind. And then we move over to the cotton fields and the slave quarters. And what we see is a, a slow, elegant, and refined life, but one that's not centered on the plantation, but centered on Southern community. And then we see the, the depiction of slavery. And throughout the film, for the principal African-American characters, Griffith does not use African-Americans. He uses white actors and blackface. 
And all of the actors in the early silent film productions, even into the almost late 20s, did their own makeup. And so the, the makeup choice here becomes minstrel show traditions of blackface. So they're white characters playing the servants of the Camerons or the interracial villains who assist Stoneman are white actors in blackface. Now, the other supernumerary extras in the film are African-Americans for the most part. And so the life of the Camerons is depicted as paternalistic, aristocratic. Slaves are shown seeing that they have plenty of time for song and dance. And, you know, there's an implicit comparison to the working hours of Northern whites, that, you know, that these African-Americans who are enslaved had it better off. And so Griffith sets this up. He doesn't dwell on this. As you said, he's more concerned with this potential romantic and also the, the friendship between the boys. It's very clear that these are two families, though from very different sections of the country, that are very easily able to fit together romantically and otherwise. But it's going to be this issue of interracial action because, of course, Stoneman's the father and he has a housekeeper who's interracial. And the implication is that. Mary Alden, who played the character of Lydia Brown, is Stoneman's housekeeper, but also his lover, his common law wife. And there lies the heart of the, the conflict that will flare up in part two of the film. All right, so America is going to be brought to civil war. How does Griffith think about why this happened? You know, if you think about the families and the life on the southern plantation, there doesn't seem to be any source of conflict, strangely enough. You know, the conflict has to be driven by abolitionists who push against the settled ways of American life. They're radical and disruptors in the course of the film. And Lincoln is a very interesting figure in the film. When he appears, he's treated sympathetically. And of course, Griffith would go on, one of his next to the last films was his sound biography in the sound era of, of Abraham Lincoln, which is not a bad film. It's not a great film, but it's not a bad film. And so Griffith saw Lincoln as this figure who could transcend American political disagreements. But of course, in order for the war to happen, the South has to be uh, provoked. And so the film depicts the South reacting defensively to people like Austin Stoneman pushing for abolition in the North and the election of Lincoln as is inappropriate. But really, it, it boils down to the attack on the news of the attack on Fort Sumter that the South has been attacked. And so this becomes, for Griffith's audience, a defensive war, and for his characters, a defensive war to protect their home from aggression. And this, of course, is, fits classically into the lost cause historiography of the time, and, and that's what's emphasized. And But we see a patriotic response from Griffith's point of view from both families, right? The sons enlist in order to do their patriotic duty for both the North and the South. And Griffith doesn't judge this. It's kept very abstract. But once combat is joined, then he's going to paint this as a case in which people of both sides are going to suffer tragically. So we have the death of young men in both sides of the enlisted armies. And then the result of this is that we can have Confederate soldiers who are going to have to defend the town of Piedmont from an attack by Black militia on the Cameron home. In the meantime, we also get the siege of Petersburg in Virginia. Many of these events are telescoped by Griffith. And actually, there is possibly a missing section of the film as we have it today. When we see the film today, basically what we are seeing is the 1921 reissue of the film. Griffith was an inveterate meddler in his own films. There's stories, possibly apocryphal, of him at retrospectives at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City going into the projection booth with a pair of scissors because he wanted to change something. But he was always tinkering with the film. So what we see today is the 1921 reissue. So we get Sherman's march on Atlanta, we get the destruction of Atlanta, and all of these vignettes add up to the main battle, which is centered around the siege at Petersburg, with that, that very famous image of Cameron uh, rallying his troops from one siege line to the other and coming across and planting his flag in the Union cannon before being wounded and then being captured. All of these moments portray the horrors of war. Griffith was opposed to war of all kinds. And although he would sort of make later Hearts of the World, which is a propaganda film about World War I, even at the beginning of World War I, he is opposed to this. It's sort of ironic to think that he's filming this in July and August and September of 1914, 
although we think that he did the battle sequences very early because he knew he had the money to have all the extras and explosions, right? And the equipment, which he had to rent horses and cannons and so forth. But it's very ironic that the siege warfare with these entrenched lines are going to be a reality in Europe just in a little bit. But throughout the Civil War segments, we see the patriotic response of both sides, but we constantly emphasize the destructiveness of war. This is very famous scene where Sherman's troops are marching, you know, it's shot in California, but they're, it's supposed to be Sherman's march to the sea. And we see the troops marching in a valley and we see a burned out farm or plantation and other signs of destruction as the Union troops are marching. And the camera slowly pans up the valley. So we see this army on the move. And just off to the left of the scene, there is this refugee family having breakfast. Those actors who were, did not know they were being filmed, we talked last time that Griffith was an improvisatory kind of guy. He and Bitzer realized that this was an, uh, these people who were just actors who were exhausted from their acting and taking a break and eating their breakfast would make an amazing vignette. And so he combines these two general images, one of an army on the march and, and the destruction that it brings. And then he's able to narrow in the epic scope of this. And of course, we're up in the valley, so we have like a God's eye vision of this, then narrow this down into the effects on this mother and her children who are portrayed as trying to survive in the midst of this destruction. And the same thing happens when we get the black militias raid on the town of Piedmont. Destruction and mayhem are the, the results of the forces unleashed by war. But for Griffith, the Civil War is unleashed by people like Austin Stoneman and the abolitionists, and it is a defensive, protective move by Southerners, which of course is how many Southerners to some extent saw the war at the time. But it, as we said, this leaves these gaping holes that the second half has to deal with. Yeah, so of course, you know, the Civil War did involve the North invading the South, but that does not say anything about the cause of the war itself. With respect to Griffith, I think you're right that these great scenes show how well he is able to put things together so that emotionally it all adds up. It all makes sense. Now, but if you stop and think about it, of course, his pacifism is itself the cause of the fact that he gives an account of the war where there is no cause of war. Say the least important faction in American politics, the abolitionists end up bearing all of the brunt because they wanted uh, an end to slavery and the war after all did bring an end to slavery. But that does not make them a cause, wishing don't make it so. In another sense, however, since one came before and one came after, they can be called cause and effect. That works in the movies, that works in poetry. It doesn't mean it's true, however. All the technique, so to speak, of cinema, all the artistry is put in service of a kind of thinking that's deeply at odds with itself. As you're saying, Griffith is anti-war. He would not be able to be interested in war in the way he is if he were not anti-war or a pacifist. Unfortunately, a pacifist is not one who understands why war even happens. Perhaps to deplore war, absolutely, one has to not be aware of the justification or the necessities or even the good of war. His ability as an artist to give the emotional vision of this devastation, the hopeless courage of these young men, and also the distant shots that show you the effects on people, on uh, the landscape, this strange, seemingly inevitable destruction unfolding. There's something to be said for that. We experience it in this way. We think of war in this way, but it is a remarkably apolitical view of war. And so perhaps Griffith's ability to persuade America to look at things this way has to do with a certain willingness already in people to see the war this way. They think that's not an issue of white supremacy. I think the problem is elsewhere. You, you can think everybody after the Civil War had to live with the consequences. But why did this have to be fought? Why did this come to us? Why did it happen? Why did it end up this way? Nobody thought it would be the slaughter it turned out to be. More Americans killed each other than were killed in all of the greater wars of the 20th century. But nobody saw it coming. Nobody realized what was going to happen. The very fact that war gets out of control, that it reveals things about people that they did not know themselves, that by the end of the war, America was very different than it had been at the beginning of the war, that made people, I think, very willing to embrace this notion that war itself is the problem. And the only people who are wicked are the ones who could want war, like the abolitionists who might prefer war to slavery. Yes, I think that 
you see this sort of strange pattern throughout the film where many things are turned around upside down from the reality, the historical reality. The thing that struck me was, you know, with Austin Stoneman and, you know, Lydia Brown, his housekeeper. Years ago, I read a, an article by Jay Nordlinger, uh, who was totally unrelated to this. He was talking, he was interviewing George Walker, and George Walker is a great African-American composer. I, I think he's now since deceased. He was being interviewed in his 90s just a, a few years ago. And, you know, he's old enough to have known his grandparents on the one side were free blacks in the north, I, and his grandparents on the other side were slaves in the south. And Nordlinger asked him, did you ever talk to your grandparents about this? And he said, one time he had a conversation with his grandmother. And the only thing that she said, and I, I this, this quote has stuck with me for years. I think it's the most perfect distillation of the horrors of slavery is that when he had this conversation with her, I think this would have been the late 1920s, early 1930s, her response and her only response was, they did everything but eat us. And of course, you know, coming from a woman, your imagination can do the rest. So here we have this film where and Thaddeus Stevens did have most likely at least a platonic, if not a romantic relationship with his light-skinned African-American housekeeper. That's portrayed as somehow normative for the North, or at least normative for abolitionists, or at least a sign of their hypocrisy. But of course, if you know from reading like the diary of Mary Chestnut and other Southern writers, especially women who had somewhat of an outside perspective, the sexual abuse of female slaves was a, was a massive problem in the South. So all through the film, we have these moments where things are turned upside down. One of the things that researching this I did not know was that Thaddeus Stevens' home had been subject to a raid by Jubal Early in the 1863 Pennsylvania campaign. So the very thing that's portrayed in the Cameron home in the South, which of course did happen to many plantations in the South because of Stoneman's raid and Sherman's march to the sea and so forth. Certainly this happened in the South. But it's ironic that this actually did happen and something like 50 or $80,000 worth of damage were done to this farm. And Stevens had to be forcibly removed by his servants and employees because he didn't want to leave his house. He wanted to face the Confederates. And Jubal Early said, words defect. They said, well, what would you have done? Would you have arrested him and taken him to Liberty Prison? He said, no, I would have murdered him, hung him and quartered his bones and sent them to every you know, capital in the South. So there's a blindness about the horrors of war being reciprocal and that the horrors of wars arise specifically out of race-based chattel slavery. And Americans at this time wanted to turn away from that. And like you said, so we get this strange war without a real cause, or at least a very minor cause is blown up into the only possible cause of the war. So when we get to the assassination of Lincoln, which is brilliantly shot and depicted, there are over 50 individual shots in this short segment that shows the assassination of Lincoln. And Griffith very carefully builds the tempo. And we see the actors portraying you know, John Wilkes Booth and Lincoln and Lincoln's guard and the audience for a, the play, you know, our mutual friend and the actors on stage. And from all of the footage, hundreds of different shots and ton of footage, Griffith brings us down to this pacing where we get the sense of this impending moment and the sudden cataclysmic shot and then Wilkes jumping onto the stage. So as, as we come to the end of the first part of the film, we also have the horrors of this assassination. And for Griffith, this is the friend of the South because of the belief that Lincoln was going to be just the Southern whites. And, and Lincoln would have been, I think, more lenient in some ways than what happened. But I think Lincoln would have also been you know, more prudent in his treatment of the South, but he also would have tried to preserve some of the gains for African-Americans, which Southerners didn't want to contemplate. So it becomes easier to make Lincoln into this figure that's going to treat them well as opposed to the radical Republicans. And so it's interesting that we have this assassination, which is carried on by a, a Southern sympathizer to, to sort of bring together the end of the horrors of the war. The other thing that we see, though, is we see that, that Elsie Stoneman has fallen in love, or at least the beginnings of love with Cameron again and the recovery from the hospital. And so the, Griffith is trying to put the train back on the tracks here that in spite of Lincoln's death, things could bring America together, but then part two brings us the additional complications. Yeah, I think this portrayal of Lincoln as the great hope of Americans coming together and then hope snatched by this cruel, cruel madness of war he is assassinated is of a piece with the a complete uh, cluelessness about the cause of war. And again, a very moving portrait, precisely because it speaks to something we all feel. That why does any of this need to happen? How can this horror somehow be unleashed by us since we all wish for the best? 
So it, it's incredibly plausible that way. But of course, Lincoln is in a very important way the cause of the war. After all, had he not been reelected in 1864, his former general would have put an end to the war since he was a copperhead, McClellan, right? There was a faction in the North against the war. Without somebody like Lincoln, this would not have gone on. And more importantly, of course, the thinking through of why the war had to happen if the South was going to succeed, that is Lincoln. Not everybody in America thought that, uh, yeah, you know what, if the South wanted to secede, we're going to have to have a war. So Lincoln is a great war president. His greatness is impossible to separate from the war, but the movie simply does this, affects the separation, because it cannot contemplate that such a thing as this war had to be done. It's strange, but I noticed this both with respect to the causes of the war and with respect to the character of Lincoln's portrayal, that why this was even done simply has to be forgotten. And to the extent to which this is an attractive portrayal, to the extent to, to which it speaks to our natural horror of war, even those of us who are not pacifists, you can see America was always going to have to have, was always going to face a great difficulty in teaching about the civil war, since everybody wishes that it sort of hadn't happened. And so once dead, Lincoln can become a martyr of not the lost cause, but of a lost opportunity for peace between North and South, which eventually will mean the same thing as the lost cause. The South shouldn't have been annoyed. Strangely enough, of course, in this analysis of the war, the abolitionists are the only real progressives. They're the only ones trying to move America forward, but they're also the only wicked people. And that seems to follow as an implication from the idea that the war didn't need to happen at all. And I think this is worth considering in all other depictions of war, the power of these images we get in war that shock us and leave us helpless as spectators. I think that has to do with the fact that we just wish it away and we can't understand why there is a necessity for it. Griffith is just maybe the best to have done it, certainly the first to have done it very, very well. So the setting for the drama of the South, of the post-war South, and the drama that brings these families to a catastrophe, all of it has to do with somehow putting them in a position where the audience thinks this is undeserved, this is also unexplained, there's no reason why any of this had to happen, it's, it's some kind of cruelty of fate. And this speaks to Griffith's romanticism. Perhaps our pacifism is always connected with a certain kind of romanticism. We see ourselves as victims of fate, not perhaps on this great grand scale that you get in Birth of a Nation, but still in whatever way is available to our imaginations or what we find plausible. And so the very fact that this is a drama, the very, the very fact that this is something that we wish to experience so that our emotions are played upon in a certain way, so that certain sentiments are aroused and we hope vindicated. This, as it were, leads us to like this kind of storytelling. Yes, and, you know, in order for there to be drama at this point, we've had this sort of mystical experience of the war, and at the very end of the film, we get a, an apotheosis of Jesus Christ, and we sort of see to me, that's Lincoln and the Christ connection, right? And this idea about pacifism are, are strongly intertwined in Griffith's thinking. But then we have to go to the second half of the film, which, of course, there's one thing that sort of bridges these two and sets us up is that this, and, and this shows the power of, of Griffith's ability to, to manipulate emotions as a poet and as a filmmaker. Cameron, uh, the little colonel, returns from the war and we see his sisters trying to decorate their sort of homespun dresses with bits of raw cotton. Uh, he calls it Southern Ermine in the inner title. And then they meet on the porch, and this is very slow, methodical, emotional build up to this point where he can embrace his sisters and then he's drawn into the house. And Griffith has a humanity to his filmmaking, whereas we can then see this as the return of any soldier home after the war and the sense of both loss and desire and reconciliation with one's own family in the sense of just being with them and reincorporation in the community, but knowing that there's always this pain behind it. And so Griffith can do something like that. And then he invests the second half of the film in his drama of reconstruction, which now portrays Stoneman is, is going to move to the South in a strange twist for his health and end up lodging with the Camerons. And in the process, we see the elevation of the freedmen, the Southern Black Americans who are now no longer enslaved. And it's a political catastrophe. This is depicted with every possible stereotype. And we see a session of the legislature where 
they're eating fried chicken and guzzling alcohol and oogling white women in the galleries. And we see ballot stuffing and the abuse of the former white elite being turned away from the ballot box. And we see the character of Silas Lynch, whose name, you know, is just kind of in Incredible when you think about this, who is another mulatto, half white, half black character who's become Stoneman's right hand man and henchman as he tries to implement reconstruction in the South. And in this, of course, our sympathies are drawn to the Camerons, who not only have they lost their social standing and their wealth, not only have they lost sons in the Civil War, but of course, then we get to the main event of the second half of the film, which where we have a character named Gus, who's a freedman who's been promoted to captain in the Union militia that's keeping order, or you know, as the film would depict it, disorder. And he confronts Flora Cameron, who he follows into the woods. And of course, this is an implied rape attempt, but rather than allow herself to be trapped by him, she throws herself off of a cliff and dies. Her brother finds her at the last moment. And of course, he's already been formulating in his mind a way to reassert the social order that has been upset by the result of the Civil War. Again, the film portrays the social order as having been beneficial if condescending to Black. So the tragedy, of course, here is that this perfectly reasonable social order has been mysteriously upended by the abolitionists. And so we have got to put this back. And the way to do this is by the creation of the Ku Klux Klan which is taken from a group of children playing ghost with a white sheet. And so this is supposedly the origin of the clan. Originally, Nathan Bedford Forrest was going to be a character in the film that was cut. And so it then passes over to Ben Cameron. His father is arrested uh, after they capture Gus, this former slave who has done this, right? Again, played by a white character in blackface and lynch him, hang him for his crimes. Then the Silas Lynch, then kicks off a search for what has happened, and they find the clan regalia in Dr. Cameron. This is the, the father's possession. And he will be rescued, including by some of his black servants. But this kicks off the final breakdown of civil order in this community. Yeah, and the most sensational parts of the movie, the editing for the attack on the town by the Ku Klux Klan to liberate them from the evils of reconstruction, and then the attack on the hut where Elsie the Lillian Gish, D.W. Griffith's muse, as you said, she's hiding there from these other very wicked black people who are no longer slaves. And the editing and the filming there, this is just wonderful. The double climax into town and out of town, the right to the rescue, all of these things are astonishing. And of course, it all ends with a double wedding. The Camerons and the Stonemans, the North and the South are intermarried. And after all, America's wounds are bound. I can't say enough for how well this is done. It's just beautiful filmmaking. But it also has this other drawback that there's more than a bit of insanity that builds up. Thinking about it now for the podcast again, I was struck especially by how plausible worries and fears and the sense of helplessness about the whole question of the war, i.e. part one of the movie, sets up the moral and emotional stakes for part two of the movie, the reconstruction problem. And you end up with these strange insanities that just like the cause of the war ends up being the abolition is the problem in the post-war situation ends up being the least powerful people involved, of course, the black people. If you think about it, it's hilarious, but when you see it on movies, you can begin to see why people were appalled by this. And of course, why some people were super excited about it. In a way, everything that they had already always hated, reconstruction can finally be blamed as a form of madness, as a lawlessness that uh, comes after the war, before the white Southerners restored their authority in this uh, rather bloodthirsty way. Yeah, when you see the riot that ensues after the lynching of Gust, and then we have this double denouement where we end up with basically Griffith reshooting his Battle of Elderbrus Gulch, which was, of course, there we have Native Americans tackling settlers in the cabin, but it's a very similar setup, but He's, you know, he's honed his technique even further. And we have, of course, the infamous Klan ride. And of course, one of the great ironies, Grail, who, who set the score, chose the Ride of the Valkyries by Wagner to set that. And of course, you know, for us, and also this idea of an Aryan birthright, which comes up, I think, at least two of the inner titles. Now, when we think of Wagner, you know, one of the associations in the modern age, of course, we think of Hitler's appropriation and obsession, although sometimes overstated with Wagner's music. And so... Yeah, there's this sense in which, again, these inversions of real history, the people least able to do something about 
the social situation as it breaks down in reconstruction are those who have suffered the most and have the least power. And here they're shown as, you know, all powerful in, in a strange way. And the clan has to come sweeping in to rescue these people. And then in the cabin, of course, we see uh, former Union troops fighting with former Confederate troops. And who is their real enemy? Well, their real enemy are Black American. And it's, it's just horrific. But as you said, I mean, the, the, the filmmaking employed is absolutely superlative. Griffith shot the Klan ride from every conceivable angle. He had experienced riders, although rather poor quality horses. Part of it, you know, at one point he's in a ditch with this cameraman. At one point, he literally saved Billy Bixer's life by pulling him out of the way as a horse kicked him and smashed the camera. And so, you know, all these incredible risks to life and limb of individuals that there's kind of a comparative insanity in the filmmaking of the time, right? Silent filmmaking was just insane and glorious and at the same time. But yeah, it's all part of this topsy-turvy way in which we as white Americans can spin the failure, the utter failure of Reconstruction. Well, was Reconstruction really a failure? Well, not entirely. I mean, there were times when in places it worked, but once protective power was removed from the minority in the South and American whites gave up on the project, then yeah, it collapsed. And uh, this sort of film allows us to take history and turn it inside out. But it's done with uh, the utmost skill. That double climax and the double wedding bring the film to an end, and we get this visitation of Christ in this thing about the inner title of the end. Of, you know, this again, this this pacifism that does not connect with historical reality, but does connect with the sort of total vision that the film has presented. And this is the vision that's going to dominate American society until the civil rights movement of the 1960s. For white America, this is going to be the narrative that they have. So Griffith is remarkably aware of the fact that although the Civil War defines America, somehow people are not very proud of it. Everybody is proud of older soldiers who fought, even as enemies, of course, North and South. But the war isn't a thing to be proud of. And at the same time, there's deep dissatisfaction with Reconstruction, which after all failed. But also, how could it have succeeded if... America gets back to being the United States of America, the South is reintegrated as states, then they're going to have states' rights. And that cannot therefore solve the problem of justice for Black people. If, on the other hand, they are not reintegrated as states, they must become some kind of occupied territory. And it's not enough to win a war. You have to then completely transform the beliefs of the people of the South. And that didn't seem to be possible. And so, in a way, what America needed and what America could do simply could not come together. However catastrophic the war, however terrifying the slaughter, at the end of it, Northerners were not in a position to change what Southerners believed or how they lived. No, and ultimately, you know, thinking about the implications of the film and the failure of Reconstruction, the problem is the only people who can achieve this and this is what the civil rights movement accomplishes, is that when African-Americans are able to truly assert their civil rights, and the only way that is possible is by the dual, you know, Martin Luther King's dual assertion of the primacy of Christianity and the promises to the Declaration, both of which are basically missing from the film. While it has this appearance of Jesus at the end, of it, and Griffith and his insanity wanted to have angels hovering over a battlefield, a modern battlefield be the end of the film, even though World War I had broken out when he envisioned this, and he actually bought $60 telephone poles that were going to be staked all over the place, and he was going to hang actual actors dressed as angels over the, the battlefield. But, you know, the sense white Americans can solve the problem, right? It, it, the reality is that African Americans have to step into their true birthright as American citizens, and when they're not given that, they finally take it, right? And that's what allows America to begin to move forward in some ways. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost that in the current climate and debate today. So the failure of Reconstruction ends up leading to the blame of Reconstruction, and it's just not so obvious how this political problem could have been solved at all. Perhaps had Lincoln not been assassinated, it would have gone better, but the problem itself would not have been solved. Yeah. This did not change on the one man. And there you see part of the problem of the war and why Americans are not proud of the Civil War. It didn't decide the issue exactly, and in a way it couldn't have. It's asking too much of what even war can achieve, and therefore it's a reminder of the limits of any transformation towards justice. 
end. In a strange way, it is uh, on a progressive basis, not in an ideological sense necessarily, that dissatisfaction with the war and pacifism and all of this stuff can lead to then a kind of racism, open or not, and a blame of reconstruction, because it does not achieve the justice that people urgently want. It does not transform the American situation in a way that people can feel comfortable with. And to some extent, to compare with the civil rights issue, civil rights as a revolution in America did not achieve quite what it was expected to. It didn't get what people today want. And so people can come around now and think that on a progressive basis, the whole Martin Luther King idea has to be abandoned. And instead, people have to scream every day about white supremacy and so on and so forth. Instead, they want too much from justice. And after all, since we are all mortal, they are understandably impatient people. But it suggests that both at the level of history and the level of dramatization for storytelling purposes, it is a very difficult thing to do to tell Americans that the war was necessary in a sense, you know, even good, and yet it could not fix problems in the way people expected after having paid such a horrifying price for it. The film, I think, encapsulates the failure, not only of Reconstruction, but its plea in a way for pacifism at the end ends up being an acknowledgement of the limitations, you know, the tragic predicament that humans find themselves in, but it doesn't propose any real means to move forward in this sort of strange mystical marriage. We have the promise of it, but as we know, as we've just discussed, this is not possible. And so one of the things that I think that maybe limited Griffith's ability to inspire successors, and hopefully when we look at his, the next film, we're going to talk about intolerance, that there is a limitation that we can achieve. And ideological progressivism sometimes fails to acknowledge that, which perhaps is why Griffith himself couldn't even follow himself up, both in his reaction to the criticisms of the film for being intolerant and the calls for censorship that would promote his ideals in the next film, Intolerance, you get a sense in which he's chafing at his at the limitations and of course the insanity in some ways of editing which is both miraculously pulled off and the ending of a birth of a nation reaches a new level where we're not going to have two climactic moments but instead four plots and four moments and four epochs of history in the sense that griffith wants to push the boundaries even further to achieve perhaps what he begins to realize he has failed to achieve at the end of a birth of a nation yeah, so that I think pertains to, as you suggested, his humanism. This is a very progressive sentiment. It's what allows him to look at America and this one couple at the same time. The notion that we're all the same, we all want the same things. And humanity must step into a new future that is brighter and more peaceful. That's just expecting too much. It's astonishing how high the hopes of this kind of thinking are. And therefore, why, when it looks on mere history or mere politics, it must distort everything in order to get a kind of revenge, to blame somebody for the failure of these high hopes to come to pass? Well, Titus, I think that when we, we consider this film, we see both the opening up of the vista of cinema and also its, its limitations immediately apparent there. Yeah, I think that's very well put, and it brings us nicely around to the conclusion of uh, this first of the D.W. Griffith movies we will be discussing. Birth of a Nation is still an astonishing thing to look at, and as we have tried to show, this is not merely a matter of looking at the history at the time or looking at the technique. This has to do with American politics in a fundamental way then and now. It has to do with the fundamental limits of politics as such, and the role poetry can play here. And the way in which history and hope do not go well together. We see this same catastrophe in our own times with the public imagination and with the stories people tell, because again, an astonishingly high promise has not been fully borne out. And the cost of keeping it going seems to not be worth it to enough people so that it might be that whatever the civil rights transformations achieved will not prove permanent. Indeed, this is both the power and the limitations of cinema because it has to do with the powers and the limitations of democracy, of our common understanding of our equal nature and of our hopes that can spur us forward, but also, if disappointed, lead us to despair and to destroy things. 
D.W. Griffith was caught up in that as much as we are caught up in our own drama in times that, again, Americans hate each other with a passion that is fairly rare, but not unheard of in our history. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it's strangely easy to understand today how people could have felt this way. As you suggested, uh, D.W. Griffith is as obsessed with 1619 as progressives are today. Yes, I think that as we look at the other films that we're going to take a look at from Griffith, starting next with Intolerance, it will be interesting to notice his evolution as the filmmaker and perhaps why Democratic audiences began to turn away from his films as we get further into his career. His limitations became perhaps painfully aware as the progressive era fades into the 1920s. I've really enjoyed being able to come on to your podcast series and to spend this time unpacking this great film flawed and difficult as it is, and uh, this great artist as flawed and difficult as he was, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity, Titus. Likewise, I'm glad to have your expertise on hand to get me thinking about these things, because I am not myself so able to deal with the issue of silent film, but with your guidance, I feel much more sure about some of the things that I have noticed and been puzzled by since uh, I could not fit these pieces together by myself. And so I hope that uh, our audience can also begin to discover silent films and look at everything involved in the American drama and the politics and in the art alike and uh, yes. make their way through this. All the best, Eric, until our next one. All right, Tinas, take care. We'll talk again soon.